let's move on to other business. So I'm going to start um, with an announcement. Uh, I sent a message out last night. It was somewhat related. I apologize for that. But I hope most of you received it. Uh, it was sent broadly to our project list and our, our assistance plans <coughs> list. Um, and it was about Mary Urich, uh, our dear colleague. Uh, the message indicated that uh, Mario has asked to step down from the position of subsistence scientist. Mario is one of uh, the real heroes on the Um He's been with us formally since 2012, most of that time a subsistence scientist. There was a period in the interim where we made him the lead of the data management system. Um, he's, he's had an incredible effect on the project. Uh, scientifically, technically, and just basically as a, as a wise person um, with very good judgment about almost any issue that's come up. Um, fortunately for us, Mario's not leaving. Uh, he will be, uh, remain uh, involved with LSST at the University of Washington, both in, in a scientific sense and supporting the DM team at UW uh, specifically in the moving object pipeline area. Um, but anyway, it's, um, it's been a tremendous pleasure to have Mario involved with this project. And so, Mario, if you could stand, and maybe we could have a round of applause, too. Now, um, when a vacancy is opened, we don't just sit there on our hands. Uh, so we're in the process of uh, moving forward to the replacement, and there's a search that's being uh, begun now. And Will, could you come up and just say a few words about that? Yeah. So. Um, Mario's leaving, and that means there are some very big shoes that have to be filled <laughs> on DM. So I'm looking for a DM subsystem scientist, and I think the concentration or a little bit of focus might be on validation of DM going into commissioning, um, as well as leading the science team and other things. So I'm here all week. If you have ideas, people you think would be interested, if you're interested, if you know collaborators who are interested, please send them my way. Uh, we are actively looking. I'm hoping that the, uh, the job advert actually comes out on the Aura pages in the next couple of days. Um, the text is all prepared. Everything's ready to go. And I think that's all I want to say about it. Thanks, Mario. So we have a bunch of interesting talks planned for this session. Beth, are you going to MC it? So let me, let me call you up, too. Okay, great. So before we kick off this plenary, we've got a few announcements, uh, changes to the agenda this morning. Uh, there's a couple of sessions that have been canceled. And uh, during the unconference, there's also a special session that Victor is going to be hosting about uh, working in Chile and moving to Chile. And that will be held here. Uh, anyone is invited to attend. Uh, this evening, there's going to be a project-only team meeting tonight at 5.30 p.m. We hope that everyone will attend. It was great fun last year. And then, uh, Chris, I'll invite you to step up to say a couple words about this evening's event, Trivia, um, uh, that everyone in the project and community is welcome to join into. And I'll give you this rock and roll mic. Yeah. Um, yeah, please join us, everybody, at 7.30 tonight uh, here in the uh, Grand Ballroom. We're going to have a trivia game. It's going to uh, be put on by Geeks Who Drink. It's not a drinking game, but it is a pub-style trivia uh, game kind of fashioned after those that are in the UK. And it should be a lot of fun, and I hope to see you guys there. Great. It's a, it's a team game, right? Yeah. You uh, form yes, teams. Team game, so you don't need to know everything about everything, right? Because it's a team game, so the pressure's off a little bit. I think it's 7.30, but will the no host bar be set up at 7 for early socializing? Question mark. That sounds, that sounds good. Great. So how about during the session, we'll yeah. get confirmation about exactly when all those logistics Absolutely. will begin. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you for that first trivia question. And do we have any more announcements? I think those are the only announcements. So, oh, there, oh, there was a T-shirt. Oh yeah, we got it. Let's put this up. Oh, thank you. I was hitting the wrong button. And t-shirts, there's more t-shirts arriving tomorrow. So if uh, the table was out of your size, please go ahead, uh, buy the table tomorrow. And there's going to be another photo at 5.15 today for those that missed it yesterday. And are they gonna be Photoshopped into the main photo? Is this a, is this a real announcement? <laughs> So Suzanne confirms, yes, it is for those who missed the photo, and there may be some photo shopping opportunities to make us have um, a collective photo. And I do know that there were people photoshopped into last year's, and I bet none of you would have ever guessed that. So great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let's Oh, wait, no, the unconference. Here we go. Uh, sorry, there's lots of awesome announcements. Uh, unconference suggestions. Ah, yes. The unconference is this afternoon. There's some excellent proposed sessions that have been put up on these large sticky notes. Noon today is the deadline for proposing sessions. So please, uh, at the coffee break, uh, go ahead, put your ideas up on the board, and then a set of folks will take a look and assign the sessions to rooms based on the number of votes. Ones with more votes will get put into larger rooms. I, I hope that everyone has been identifying uh, session scribes who will report back on Friday, just a minute or two, on the outcomes of each breakout. Uh, if only everyone was so lucky, I had Phil Marshall volunteer in uh, my breakout yesterday before I even finished my sentence. Um, tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a public talk that's led by Victor and Chuck Clavers. I think it's going to be uh, pretty awesome. I hope we get a turnout like last year. This room was absolutely packed for Lucianne's talk last year. And there'll be a lot of members of the public who are interested to interact with folks in the LSST project and science community. So please, if you're interested to interact with members of the public, come. Oh, where's my badge? Wear your badge um, and enjoy the evening uh, presentation tomorrow. So let's switch this up. So the clicker's not working. Yeah, I'm trying to figure that out okay. right now. Super. Okay, great. So as we make the transition here, the topic of this morning's plenary, as I briefly introduced on Monday, is, is the hidden heroes of LSST. And on the title slide, it says that everyone is the name of the presenter. It's really a cross-section section intending to represent all the effort that's being put in across the project uh, to build LSST. Oh, good. Uh, and while I'm giving a little opening spiel, I'll draw your attention to item number one here. Midway through this uh, plenary, we're going to take a little break and try and experiment um, where everyone's going to have a chance to contribute your thoughts. And so if you, uh, you can do it on your computer or use it, do it on your phone, and that way you can download the app and use um, just the, uh, the phone network instead of the networking uh, to be able to, to participate in this in the middle of the session. So there's a few different inspirations uh, for this session. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Ian. And I'll, I'll just highlight one of them before being quiet and stepping aside um, to, to make room for all of our contributors. So recently, LSST participated in Asteroid Day, and one of the, the contributions from, uh, for Asteroid Day was this wonderful video that was made at the University of Washington, um, and also with support from the local uh, project office team, in particular, Emily Acosta, uh, Suzanne Jacoby, Amanda Bauer, and others. And here, LSST has a YouTube channel. And for the love of God, everybody do not go to YouTube right now and start trying to look at LSST videos because I really want the networking to work in 40 minutes when we do this experiment. But later, you can go and you can find these Asteroid Day and other LSST videos on there. And when I watched the University of Washington video, there were students, postdocs, scientists, faculty, who all were saying words about what the UW team was doing. And I appreciated all the supporting work behind the scenes that went into it. And I found it to be incredibly inspiring and exciting about LSST. And I thought that in my head, in the next uh, project meeting that I went to, Chuck Gessner just looked and he said, wow, that made me really, like seeing these videos made me so excited about LSST. And I thought, well, what a treat. What a treat if we could just hear uh, from a broad cross-section of the project. So the way that this is going to go is so we've got these 12 folks lined up in this order, and we're going to take a little bit of a break in the middle. And for people that aren't familiar with the concept of a lightning talk, it's going to be a very strictly run, <laughs> four to five slides per person, five minutes only. I will stand up when it's five minutes. The speakers know I will physically approach them shortly thereafter so that we can keep things moving 
briskly. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and the most important thing to me is that everybody who's watching and enjoying these presentations gives a huge amount of support and enthusiasm for everybody getting up to say a few words about who they are and what their work is. Um, especially because you know not everyone is as used to getting up uh, and talking uh, about LSST as I am and some of the other people who are, who are always up here. We're not going to take any talks between uh, the presentations in the interest of fluidity, but I would... In, did, what, did I say talk? <laughs> Sometimes I... yeah. Uh, any questions between the talks? Thank you, John. But what I would do is encourage everybody who thinks of questions as you're listening to these folks speak to bring those to the project team event, um, to bring those to the trivia and to the social times, to you know maybe look at some of the folks who are up on the stage and think, oh, I don't know who they are. Maybe I want to invite them to be with me on my trivia team. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and kick this off with Brian from Slack. Maybe like clap for everybody collectively. Do you want to use the remote control? Uh, yeah, okay. Do you want to use the hand mic or the? I'll just use this mic. Okay, great. And I'm going to turn my computer around and you'll okay. see the timer too. Hi everybody. Um, I'm Brian Van Cleveren. And um, if you didn't know my name, uh, well, I didn't either until I turned five. So um, <laughs> I actually found out on a birthday cake. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a software developer at Slack. I've uh, been there since 2010. I work on the Fermi Gamma Ray uh, Space Telescope as well as LSST. Um, I work in the data handling um, sec uh, group for that at Slack. And I've also worked for the desk and uh, some other uh, projects at Slack. Um, before all that, uh, I worked at the University of Utah in the uh, uh, on the high res and telescope array cosmic ray detectors and somewhat famous for discovering the oh my god particle and uh, <laughs> um, so w mostly that just meant we walked around a lot in the middle of the desert and fixed GPS antennas on surface detectors. Um, in my free time uh, I like to cook a lot. I love Jacques Pepin. Um, uh, I like playing music and hiking around the Point Reyes seashore in uh, Northern California. Um, in one sentence, what I do for the project is I work on the DAX team uh, uh, building HTTP data interfaces, so just web interfaces and uh, databases and helping out with Slack and attempting to know a lot about the IVOA. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that just a little bit more. Um, <coughs> I actually got started on the project a nebulous three years ago working on image and metadata management, and that sort of parlayed into working on uh, the web interfaces as part of the DAX team. And uh, as part of that, I've also been uh, active in the IVOA community. And um, it's sort of, it's great because I get to go to places like Shanghai and, and South Africa, um, but not so great because you have to do a lot of stuff with XML. Um, <laughs> before that, uh, I, I would, uh, sort of helping out sort of tangentially with the LSST project in the camera, um, mostly the data handling and some applications along that. Uh, a lot of the tools are actually derived from the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Um, <coughs> uh, as part of DESK, I also help out a lot with um, the computing infrastructure and uh, uh, the data challenges and Twinkles project, and I'm also a convenient uh, DESK DM intermediary um, partially because I'm on both, and uh, part of the reason, uh, because I'm on both, uh, uh, I kind of got put in this position where I was implementing Slack for the project and the community. Um, I was sort of just a good person, also with the, the web interface background, so I uh, got sort of happily stuck in this position. <laughs> um, uh, so. Uh, a year ago at this meeting, we had worked on um, trying to figure out how to extend uh, Slack, uh, which we were on HipChat for the project, and bring the community and everybody inside all in one sort of team. And so here's a, here's a little plot of the Slack history, and you can sort of see um, the beginning right after the uh, meeting a year ago where we were sorting, uh, uh, starting to test things out. And then the initial bump when we started bringing uh, 
project DM people in, and then there's a few more bumps where we brought camera people in. And uh, the big bump early on was just bringing in desk people, um, and then the holidays. <laughs> Uh, and, and you sort of see that it's been steadily increasing over the last year um, up until a, a sort of peak about a year, uh, a month ago. Um, and this was the, the desk collaboration meeting. So we have about 382 active people that week that were uh, checking the application and 283 people participating by sending messages. Um, it's probably going to be similarly busy um, barring internet issues this week. Um, just a little information on getting onto Slack. Uh, the only real requirement for really to get on the Slack is you should have data rights, um, but it also helps if you're in the contacts database for the project. Um, and if you don't know what that is, uh, you can also email me. Um, uh, and it's also good if you're in a science collaboration because then you have people to talk to uh, who have some sort of uh, shared goal in mind. Um, how to get on Slack if you're not on it, which you should be. Uh, if you're in a science collaboration, tar, uh, try talking to your chair. Uh, otherwise, you can email me directly, but there's only one me, so we're trying to figure out uh, how to make a more sustainable a way of, of getting people on. Um, so uh, that's all I have. So you can. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, so first of all, before even presenting myself, I want to point out my personal fun fact, which is that this is my first presentation in front of a crowd, um, and one of my biggest fears <laughs> is. Um, thank you. My biggest fears is public speaking. So. I've always been more of a behind the, per behind the scenes type of person, so please bear with me on this. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Carol Chirino. I'm the senior site administrator at, uh, in La Serena. And just to give you a little background about myself, I was born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta, I, where I studied administration at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. Um, from there, I started to work directly at the University of Alberta Hospital. And after a few years there, I moved to Chile where I joined the administration and facilities group at Gemini. And after eight years there, it brought me to my current position at LSST. So, <laughs> so my contributions to this diverse organization is mostly in the administrative area. Um, since I was the first admin to start in La Serena, I've been involved, I've had the opportunity to be involved in various areas of the project. Um, from the first dome celebration to preparations of construction, the arrival of employees and contractors, documentation of procedures and policies, and safety issues. And pretty much anything and everything that's brought to my attention. Um, as most of you know, we, we're a small group in the cell, so we're a very close knit team now. When we have visitors and colleagues, we like to make them feel at home. And we've had some of you visit us already down there, and I really hope that your experience was a good one. Um, I mention this because for me it's important to, uh, as part of my job, to make our visitors and colleagues feel welcomed and uh, make you feel part of the team when they're at the site. So there is never a day uh, working at LSST and I sit in. There's always something new, either on the summit or in the basic specific construction. This has given me um, a lot of experience in different areas where I was involved before, mostly in technical aspects of the construction, also of the building. Um, so I'm also involved in that as, as well as coordinating logistics for the summit team and for the contractors, maintenance of the LSSD vehicles, and so on and so on. Um, but I also get to go to the summit, and this is one of my favorite parts of my job, because when I first started to work, and I go to the summit, there was nothing, just pretty much gone. And then I got to see how it progressed, and just to see how the building is right now makes me really proud to be part of this project and part of history. So this is just a general overview of, uh, of what I do. So I do encourage you to please stop me in the halls. Um, I'll be at the registration table. If you have any questions regarding visiting Chile, um, I can help you with anything. So thank you. <laughs>
So, uh, hello, LSST. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is John Andrew. I work with the uh, Telescope and Sight Group as an engineering associate. I started working on the project uh, in November of 2005, so I've been with the project for quite a while. Uh, prior to LSST, I worked on the Gemini Infrared Spectrogram and the NOAO Extremely Wide Field Inf Infrared Imager Project. So I'm familiar with uh, telescopes and astronomy. Um, I have over 30 years of experience using many different CAD systems uh, for engineering. I also uh, have a chance to teach some night classes at the local uh, community college here uh, in AutoCAD at Geometric Dimensioning and Tolerancing. And this has give me, given me a great respect for those who teach. Um, what I do for LSST is I design some of the mechanical equipment and processes for the telescope and site group. I also manage the baseline design and the as design CAD models and drawings uh, using PDM software. And on this slide you can see some of the drawings that we use for the ICD to try to uh, communicate this mechanical information to the different vendors and different subsystems. So it's extremely complicated. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about the project that I've been involved from from the beginning and is still evolving as we as we go through the through the project here in the construction is some of the handling and integration and maintenance access while we're on the telescope. Uh, if you look at the images on the left hand side, you can see the integration of the M1 M3 mirror into the uh, the telescope. Uh, if you look uh, just below that. You can see the integration of the M2 system uh, into the telescope using the dome crane. And uh, then on the right, you can see the integration of the camera assembly uh, in, into the top end of the telescope. Uh, one of the challenges was getting access to the camera while it was in the telescope, in the basically the center of, of the telescope. So we came up with some unique ideas for some extending platforms that go out and uh, actually get you right up next to the camera. Um, one of the real things that I enjoy about my work is going from basically concepts to working hardware. So, And you can see some images of that, that hardware here. Um, early on on the right, the upper right hand side, you can see uh, those towers there. That was a microthermal array that we used to do some site testing and determine the final height of the telescope. Below that, you can see some sky brightness monitors that were used on site to determine how close we could actually observe to the moon. Uh, in the center, you'll see some images of the M1M3 container, and we had to move that from the mirror lab here in Tucson to a hangar located at the airport. There were a lot of challenges with this. Uh, one of them was basically, how do you move a very large piece of equipment down through the streets of Tucson and then through a gate that wasn't actually big enough to fit the, uh, the mirror container through? And then also, how do you offload that mirror container into the hangar without using a crane? So there were a lot of, lot of challenges there. And then all the way on the left-hand side, uh, I was responsible for uh, disassembling and removing the Calypso telescope from Kitt Peak and relocating it to Tucson for refurbishment. Uh, there was some challenges with this because the documentation for the telescope was not very clear as to how it was to be disassembled or how to handle the optics. So I had to do a lot of reverse engineering to make that happen. So, uh, thank you. Hola, hola. So my name is Constanza Araujo. This is my confluence picture. Um, but most of the people know me as Connie. And also I discovered once in my door, Doña Constanza. So it's that my kind of nicknames. My official job title is a telescope inside lead optics engineer. I'm also the M1M3 cam. 
I have worked as optics engineer at ESO, the MPE, the Max Planck for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany, and the University of Cologne. And before joining LSST, I was working in the Gemini Observatory in La Serena. I uh, have a dual citizenship, so I'm Chilean and German. Uh, this is kind of okay most of the time, but this year we have the Confederations Cup. I know here there are so many soccer fans. So we have two games, Chile against Germany. Um, well, I will not comment further on this. <laughs> As some of the fun facts, I was born in a very small city, and with the years it's getting smaller and smaller. Uh, in the south of Chile, it's called Trayen. So if you have problems pronouncing my family name, Araujo, 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 uh, when you get like birthplace, Trayen, so I'm always in trouble. So I'm a bit my story with LSST. So while I was working, waiting for my working visa in La Serena to move to Tucson, I had the opportunity to attend the first stone ceremony. And this was actually the last time I was in the summit. So I'm looking forward to see the building with my eyes in the coming future. After moving to Tucson, I also was part, as <laughs> John mentioned, of the tra uh, transport of the M1, M3 mirror container from the UFA to the millionaire facility. So you can see also part of the crew. This was like at three in the morning, waiting for this big transport. I'm also one of my responsibilities is to babysitter this container, so every two to three months I go to Millionaire and inspect there is no graffiti. I have a count of the population of spiders on the container, so everything is fine. So as Telescope and Site team member, I also participate in several reviews and inspections. So there is some pictures with some review with part of the team and Mountain View for the exoplanet rotator. Uh, some inspections in the very early stages of the mirror cell at Kate Industries, and a recent picture of our, um, the coating plant FDR in Germany. So, no doubt, I'm having a great time these two years I've been in the project. But not everything is fun, so sometimes, at least every two years, we need to write a technical paper and attend conference and give technical talks. Uh, here, this is a very, was a small Astro engineering workshop in Chile, so where I was asked as a Chilean optical engineer working in one of the new telescopes that are going to be built in Chile. I mean, we have GMT and also ELT in the north of Chile. And the idea was also to inspire the younger generations. So I get together with a group of like high, high school students, and I hope I motivate to pursue a career in engineering. Also, I'm a proud member of the Society of Women Engineers, and I have represented with some colleagues here the AURA and LSST in this last year conference. You can see in, in the lower part of the picture, this is a group of women engineers and uh, representatives of the different observatories. So there was GMT, TMT, ESO, uh, Space Telescope, Gemini, and LSST. And also, uh, I'm also a very proud member of the organizing committee of the Chilean National Day celebration in Tucson. So I hope you have in your calendars the 15th of September we're having this year celebration. But my prime focus, like in optical terminology, M1, M3. I'm the M1, M3 CAM, and I'm also keeping the countdown. In 41 days, this was yesterday, today is 40 days, we are preparing for M1 and 3 cell integration. So my work is not only to coordinate the hardware delivery of my main vendor, this is K, so on one side you see the surrogate and the cell, these are my main hardware, but also the internal work of the team. So everything goes inside the cell, we are building this in-house. So here are some pictures of our team. I need a team picture also, part of the conference and also some of the meetings. So thank you very much. This study is to be continued.
Okay. Hello. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Freddy Muñoz Arancibia, the Summit Integration Engineer. Uh, it's nice to be here, speaking on behalf of all the Summit crew. Uh, I'm a mechanical guy, mechanical person, and I have been working almost a decade around the Andes Mountains in astronomy projects deployment. Uh, one of those mountains being the highest one in the world, outside the Himalayas Ridge, uh, flowing from, for example, site testing to indeed equipment installation and then physical instrument uh, commissioning. Uh, my last job there was next door in the CDIO Blanco telescope for the dark energy camera instrument that you saw in that picture. Um, so the, in the fun fact, uh, is somebody in this room Irish? Well, for all of you know, I born in St. Patrick's Day, March 17. <laughs> so next, next March, you send me a postcard, please. I will really appreciate it. <laughs> so what we do up there? Basically, um, all of you in your project areas, you have your own subsystems, and they require your own integration. But we need to integrate all of you in the summit, which is a very not that large space. So if I walk two steps in the wrong direction, I fall down the hill. So we need to coordinate a lot of very, very large pieces. So it's basically put things together with us to play a large scale chess game with 10 tons of weight pieces. This uh, requires a lot of coordination between different vendors, including domes, uh, the elevator, the this room size coding facility, a lot of uh, trenches, digging, cranes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the base of that, it's detailed um, planning to control the interface, um, a lot of rigging and lifting, which I do the most. And all of this in a very rush environment. I mean, the change daily, there is constants, constraints, and a lot of people moving around. For example, we will see the scenario now. This is a common picture of a cutting edge shipping and logistics system because every large project in these mountains requires a very, very suitable uh, donkey's army. There's a very reliable machine. So basically, uh, as the construction grows up, then we move to large scale equipment transit, assembly of uh, different things, control, monitoring, and for example, that picture is for the large dome asymmetry track. And to achieve what? Because our final, uh, our final goal there in the summit is to replicate what you do in your own laboratories or factory tests. So at, at the, uh, by the end of the day, we have something like this installed on the mountain. And I want to use this time just to show the current status of the picture with very bad weather. Um, and I use this time to thank everybody there because, as, uh, as mentioned, uh, all of this is possible due to a large, large amount of workers all around the summit working hard and very, very de dedicated on this with high precision. That creates what, is, what we have in front of, of eye, or, our eyes now, which is the side moving from this condition to this condition and as it is now, and growing up to the sky. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Okay. Uh, I'm J. Matt Peterson. I'm more than just the mononym, which you'll always hear, which is just J. Matt. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm a generalist, uh, software engineer, and uh, I have a background doing all sorts of different things, uh, and <clears throat> including uh, Let's see, what do we have? DMV software, uh, reliability engineering prediction software, uh, chip scale packaging and manufacturing, cloud uh, and scientific pipelines and bioinformatics. Uh, and that was with Cyverse here at U of A. Uh, I'm previously with uh, DM Square, where I did uh, uh, Git LFS and the Conda builds, or the recent Conda builds. Uh, and uh, an ELK system, which uh, stands for Elasticsearch uh, 
Logstash, and Kibana. Uh, and then uh, right at the end, uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, since then, I've moved to EPO, and I'm the first technical person, minus uh, Ben, who has, who's a project uh, manager and has a technical background. Uh, so I create t technologies and amplify discoveries <coughs> and catalyze interest in LSST. This is my one sentence that's supposed to describe what I, uh, what I do. And since I'm pretty much the only person on EPO and the only person that's making, like actually building these things out right now, this tends to be uh, true. Looks like this year uh, our goal is to expand and hire about five people. Uh, which is great. I thought this quote was appropriate. I'm not going to try to say this French name, but it's the guy that wrote uh, The Little Prince. Uh, and it's, you can read it here, it's totally accurate. This is like super important to us. Uh, if you, oh, Okay, I'll read it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, if you want to build a ship, don't herd people together to collect wood. Don't assign them tasks and work but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea, right? That's the point of EPO, in my opinion. Uh, so I wanted to just give like a couple, uh, well, treat this more like a proper lightning talk and actually pitch something. Uh, so first I'm pitching EPO, and second I'm pitching uh, like using engineering to actually amplify and be part of a catalyst for uh, EPO. Uh, so there's two parts I've just started, like in June. So there's two parts so far. Uh, one part uh, of what I've been working on is uh, the science, science notebooks. And these ex uh, just extend DM system directly. Uh, so we get a lot of, uh, there's a lot of bonuses that you get, you know, like everything is shared. Uh, and we can push things like user experience and user interface improvements back to DM, and then we also can pull in all the good real science bits that are super important to meeting uh, EPO's uh, needs. <clears throat> and uh, second, there's the Sky Viewer, uh, which is far more accessible for the general public uh, since it's uh, uh, s relatively simple. Uh, right now we're using Aladdin Light in uh, Aladdin to create it, which is uh, uses hips and uh, heel picks, which integrates really well with the science notebook. So uh, already there's an iPi widget that integrates directly with uh, the science notebook. Uh, and finally, uh, I would just like to say that I am open to hearing everyone's ideas. We have a lot of experts that go really deep in all sorts of different uh, areas. Uh, and EPO can use your input, like something that might be out of scope uh, for whatever you're doing may very well be in scope uh, for EPO. Uh, and finally, uh, exactly how we do movies in time domain, uh, I think it's still an open question, like how to make it really awesome and make the general public excited about that. So if you have an idea about how to do that and how to integrate alert streams or even do it later on, uh, we're open. Come talk to me. I'm jmat on Slack or Twitter or GitHub or jmat at jmat.org or jmat at lsst.org. So yes, send it to me. I'm interested uh, and thanks. Use a keyboard. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bo Xin. I'm a associate scientist uh, on the Aura LSST project. Um, my professional background is in experimental particle physics. Uh, for my PhD thesis, I made some precise measurements uh, for testing calculations in the quantum field theory that describes the strong force. So 
as most of you know, probably the strong force is what holds um, quarks and antiquarks together to um, form protons and neutrons, and also what holds the protons and neutrons together to uh, form the nuclei. But um, I have a question for the audience here. So, how big or how small is a quark? How how small? <laughs> okay. So the answer is, um, according to our best theory, quarks are point-like, meaning um, they are infinitely small. Experiments show that they are no bigger than 10 to minus 18 meter. That is how small they are. So one day, I decided that I want to do something big. <laughs> Everybody here likes to do something big, right? <laughs> so the universe is big, and it's expanding. And the better news is the expansion is accelerating. So here I am in this uh, world of big mirrors, big field of view, big data, and big science. But um, soon after I made the transition, um, unsurprisingly, I found out that, at least for my job, no matter it's big or small, it actually requires the same set of skills, meaning analytical skills, modeling, simulations, I deal with uh, statistics and systematics, and of course, I do a lot of programming. So to summarize what I do for LSST, I only have four words. That is technical system performance analysis. So most of the time, I work as a member of the project systems engineering team. Uh, I want to say that I really enjoy working th in this team, in this environment, because I get to interact with all kinds of excellent people from across the product, across the subsystems, and the vendors as well. And I also enjoy working on subjects across the disciplines uh, that are important for the performance of RSST. So my day-to-day -day job um, has a lot to do with the point spread function. Uh, how big they are, how elliptical they are, and how uh, it's affecting the detection limit of LSST together with uh, throughput and other factors. In order to do that job, in the past few years, I've been learning quite a bit about things like uh, optical testing, mirror fabrication, optical defects. Um, I wrote code um, for, I wrote the LSST wavefront sensing software code and I wrote the active optics control code, and I built a integrated model of the LSST observatory. And recently I started transitioning into uh, the commissioning effort. So at other times, um, you will find me wearing my scientist hat. So when I'm doing that, most likely I'm still thinking about the point spread function. So here I just to show some example plots um, these are from some recent work with Jocko and others. Um, just briefly, on the left-hand side, you have the um, seeing wavelength dependence power parameter versus the seeing itself using the SDSS Stripe 82 data and the comparisons um, with the von Karman atmosphere model pre uh, with different outer scale. And on the right-hand side, you have the uh, PSF size spatial structure function using the same data and comparison with uh, full same simulations and CFHT measurements. So that is the sort of thing I do. Uh, if you are interested in uh, similar things, please come talk to me. Thank you very much. Hello, great. So, uh, so awesome, that was our first uh, set of talks. And now we're gonna take a little break from lightning talks. Um, the first thing that we're gonna do is invite uh, Lucienne up. Um, I butchered the update on unconference and how that's gonna work. So she's gonna go ahead and fix that. Um, thank you, Lucienne.
Okay, butchered might be a little strong. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just a little bit of clarity about unconference se session suggestions. Um, just so you know, anything that you want to have a session on, you can have a session on. There is no selection process, anything like that. The 12 noon deadline is just so that we can get an idea of how many people are planning on attending sessions and how many suggestions there are. So that will allow us to do nominal room assignments. Um, when the unconference happens, we're going to congregate out here by the board. There'll be a couple minutes for people to suggest um, additional sessions and to find rooms for them. Um, your session can happen in any of the assigned rooms. You could even go to the pool. It's really up to you. But you can talk about whatever you want. Um, so when the unconference starts, uh, we'll gather out here for a couple minutes. We'll talk about um, some additional possibilities. You can check uh, where your session, if you suggested one, has been assigned. And then we can all go on on our merry way. All right. OK, great. So we're going to try. Um, there were two things that we had planned to try. And it's been suggested that um, the first one uh, may not be working right now. Uh, and so <laughs> this was a chance for everyone to contribute, what do you do for LSST? And there was going to be a word cloud popping up real time. Um, but let's go ahead. Oh, look, the movie's in there, Chris. <laughs> so Chris Montgomery, our training coordinator, uh, had this uh, fun idea to populate a Google map showing where folks are going to be for the eclipse next week. You might be where you live. You might be somewhere else. You might be traveling to see the eclipse. I didn't know there was such a thing as a Google map until yesterday. Uh, I knew what a map uh, is and what Google is. So he's made this uh, URL shortener here that you can go to and then click on uh, where you're going to be. And the idea is that we'll display the aggregate results, sort of seeing where the broad LSST community is going to be. I think maybe at tomorrow morning's plenary session or some other appropriate time. So uh, you can try to go to this URL now. Uh, if you can do it on your phone or if the network is, is uh, snappy enough, or you can just write it down. And we'll post it. Let's post it on the Slack channel and other, uh, other venues that uh, folks are here. Maybe we'll send it. And uh, out via community and other things. So that's sort of a fun thing. So um, since the, there may be a technical limitation to do this, and I still want us to take a few more minutes break before hopping in and seeing, where's all my light? I'm like a Luddite here. I think, we, I, th I think we're out of the, I think we're out of PowerPoint. You just, <laughs> you just oh, click on it. You are. <laughs> now, would you like to use this microphone or this one? Yeah, and so hold it pretty close. There's a little, you know, sometimes for sort of feedback. And do you like to use the presenter? Or you can also click on the down arrow once we've got PowerPoint or whatever. Okay. And see my computer there? Mm -hmm. I'm going to wake it up, and I'm going to put a five-minute timer so you can see exactly okay. when it's running. Okay. Can you repeat that again? Uh, so so this one is for dancing. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank yep. you. And the screen. Okay. Welcome back. <laughs> That was fun, and I wonder what's happening on Netflix and um, in the bar. So my name is Xin Fang Chiang. I'm a um, research scientist at NCSA, University of Illinois. I was born in Taiwan. I came to the States more than a decade ago um, and went through school. And I joined the data management subsystem around two years ago. I work in the data facility at NCSA. In particular, I work in data processing. So over the last two years, I work with LSST. I work on multiple different projects. And some were quite different from some others. But most recently, I've been mostly trying to provide offline batch processing service facade to my DM colleagues. Particularly, that means I execute processing campaign and make sure the data products are generated the way they are intended to be generated. So to give you an example of what that means, um, um, back in May, we uh, just a few months ago, we carried on a large reprocessing uh, campaign using HSC data. So HSC Hyperstrom Cam um, had their first uh, data release earlier this year. So we took all of those data, around 6,000 visits of the raw input um, for this exercise of uh, reprocessing. So um, if we compare those numbers to LSST number, um, in terms of the number of visits, that's not even a week of LSST data. And if we compare that number in terms of the data size, that's not even a night of LSST data. 
But before LSSD happened up and running, giving us the data, let's just pretend this is big data and we could do some exercise with this. So we carry out uh, the large uh, processing campaign and we use our own DM software stack and run all of these on our own verification cluster that's physically located in NCSA. So on the right hand side, you see all these pictures. They are our LSST data management machines and on, at NCSA. In, in the right circle, uh, it shows where the verif verification cluster is. So over the course of around a month, I submitted more than 10,000 jobs to this machine. And that means I took more than um, 500 cold weeks of the computing time from the verification cluster. Um, to give you some ideas what that means, it's like if you if we were to run this on one CPU machine, it would take more than nine years to finish. So I don't recommend you running that on your laptop. So I was responsible for resolving any issues that came up during this uh, reprocessing campaign and working with my colleagues at NCSA and Princeton to resolve all the issues. After around a month, we ended up with more than 11 million of files, which is more than 160 terabytes of um, files on the disk that my DM colleagues have been using for more exercise. So on the left, you see this curve. That's how this data uh, accumulated over uh, the reprocessing campaign. And so just every day, I put more and more data on the disk. And I know I'm not the favorite of our storage engineer. <laughs> So on the right, you see some uh, example pictures, some beautiful pictures that our software stack generated. And on the low, uh, lower right is how um, different science pipeline take uh, CPU time um, during this campaign. So with that, we instantiated the initial batch processing ser service facade. And we are still working to transition into the next phase of their service, um, trying to improve the production system. And we plan to run our next reprocessing campaign later this year, hopefully with an improved um, system and um, progressing to the uh, operation. And meanwhile, I also process a small set of HSC data every other week, so my DM colleagues could use this for integration tasks, for QA, for verification, validation, and so on. So that's the focus of what I do recently. I also work on any other things that to gain operation experience and to make the operation and production happen. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, I am John Perico. I'm a research scientist at the University of Washington in the data management team. Uh, uh, as you can see in the photos, I'm a climber, a biker, and a fiddler. Um, uh, my claim to fame on that last one is that my band, shown in the picture, has played music at IKEA multiple times and we've been paid for it. Uh, <laughs> Um, before coming to LSST, I uh, worked uh, with SDSS data, uh, galaxy spectroscopy and galaxy clustering, and most recently uh, I worked on the SDSS operations software to make sure that the telescope could work um, and take data every night. Uh, shown there is a picture I took of the SDSS telescope uh, taking a calibration exposure. Um, uh, some of you here right now are probably looking forward to commissioning um, when LSST starts to actually operate, and uh, you too will be able to receive phone calls at any, any hour of the night. Uh, and to, to each of you, I say that I am both sympathetic and a little bit envious. Uh, but what am I doing for LSST? Uh, I am responsible for uh, Joint Cal, which is a piece of software originally written by Pierre Estier of N IN2P3, uh, which will fit the astrometry and photometry across all CCDs on the entire focal plane using all available exposures plus a reference catalog simultaneously. Um, and we need this in order to meet our science goals. Uh, and the way this works is we build up a model uh, of, the, of the contributions to the distortions and the absorption of photons as they come down through the sky and go through the atmosphere, the telescope optics, the camera optics, 
the, the inexact positioning of the CCDs in the grid and the, inexact, uh, the imperfections in the actual um, alignment of the pixels in each individual CCD. Uh, and this, this model contained, potentially contains thousands of components, so we're going to need a lot of data to actually reliably constrain the model, but fortunately, not enough data is not a problem LSST is going to have. Uh, and so, uh, but more than just a lot of data, we need good software in order to actually uh, perform this fit to thousands of exposures in a reasonable amount of time. And that's what I'm building. So you've seen some pictures of the hardware components that people are building. Uh, this is a little snippet of the most recent uh, component of the photometric model that I'm adding. Joint Cal is mostly written in C++, which is a bit of a challenge for me because before coming to LSST, I did most of my work in Python. Uh, uh, and we need, we need to write this piece in C++ for performance reasons. Um, uh, but while I'm currently extending the model, we can actually run Joint Cal on currently available data to test it out. And as an example, Dominique Boutigny has been reprocessing CFHT and HSC data uh, using Joint Cal, and uh, you can see the example here comparing processing of single frames with Joint Cal's processing of a number of HSC full focal planes, where the relative astrometric repeatability improves from 40 milli arc seconds to 7 milli arc seconds. So that's already, with the current simple model that's in Joint Cal, uh, approaching very close to the science goals um, using HSC data. Uh, and this is just with the simple model. As I improve the model, as we, as we build the model up, this can only get better. Uh, but more than just uh, meeting our astrometric and um, photometric science goals, you can learn some interesting things when you have a robust model like this of the whole system. Uh, Gary Bernstein has been doing some really excellent work uh, for DECAM. Uh, there's a link to their paper there describing their astrometric model for DECAM using a very similar style of model to what we're building in JointCal. Uh, the plot here is from the paper, um, and it's of the stacked residuals of 850 exposures for one CCD after you've taken out all of the things that you know about the atmosphere, the optics, the positions of the CCDs, and the imperfections in the pixel grid. Uh, that radial feature you see there is actually from the edge of, a, an, of an electrical connector on the back of the CCD distorting the pixel grid. Uh, so we hope that um, as we build up a really good model of, uh, of our telescope, um, we can find some of these interesting features in the data and end up producing uh, the most accurate photometric and astrometric uh, catalog of any ground-based survey uh, ever. Um, and of course, this is going to be an ongoing project through commissioning and observation um, because we don't know what we don't know about the system until we actually tar start taking data. But I look forward to helping us find out. Thank you. Okay, um, hello. So, my name is Sven Hamann. Uh, my name is Sven Hamann, um, and my job is Systems Electronics Engineer at Slack. So, by now, I have more than 15 years of experience in the design of uh, readout electronics for detectives. Um, first, I worked at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany because I'm born in German. Um, and uh, there I was working on the focal plane instrumentation of a number of X ray uh, satellites missions most of them not launching. Um, and uh, so there was particularly the PNCCD readout of Erosita that is hopefully still gonna launch. Um, and the depth fed readout of uh, XUS and IXO, which is basically canceled, but now it's revamping at Athena. Um, then from there I moved uh, to, to Slack because Slack has uh, LCLS, which is a free electron laser. And that's basically an X-ray laser. And so you need X-ray detectors for an X-ray laser to make pictures. And so I worked on there on X-ray detectors. Now, 
There is an astonishing similarity between the fully depleted X-ray detectors, which we use to detect X-rays, and the deep depletion, fully depleted backside illuminated CCDs, which LSST is using. Um, and so then in 2014, I jumped on the LSST project working on this, basically the same topic, just at different wavelengths. Okay. So in, in one sentence, I work on CCD readout electronic boards for LSST. They are also called REBs. Their design, test, characterization, and the full-scale production. Okay. Um, so how does that basically look like? Well, the design is we obviously have requirements and specifications, and we have uh, um, the schematic design and the simulations, and then we have a large amount of uh, testing of prototypes. I'm a big fan of prototype test-driven development, um, especially in our field of science that, that has proven to, to, to be working. Um, the, a single channel of LSST readout electronics is actually quite conservative, um, but the pure scale of the project, having more than 3,000 channels crammed into the cryostat just under the CCDs, that makes it a challenge um, and, and makes it frankly quite awesome. Um, so by now, um, we obviously have finished uh, all our design work. We have settled on a, on a final design, um, and uh, this is the REB5. And so now it's going to basically doing the production. And it's one thing if you can make a prototype of one board and show, hey, that works, that's great. It's a completely different thing making 100 of them, which all work in the exact same way, in schedule, in budget. Um, and so we set up uh, this production thing where we also have not only to manufacture and assemble those boards, but also to test them. Everything aboard has to be, has to be screened for its performance, um, has to go through a number of environmental tests. So here you see boards which are located in the oven uh, where they go through thermocycling and a burn-in test, everything aboard. And also uh, the boards on the vacuum chamber down there, uh, that's the residual gas analysis because everything aboard is screened for its outgassing performance because only boards which do basically not outgas <laughs> below what we have specified will go into the camera. Um, and then finally, um, a package of boards uh, is going to be packed in these nice carry cases and is sent to Brookhaven, where Brookhaven takes the boards and then assembles science raft uh, RTMs. Um, I'm also doing the job, so you've seen boards, uh, these are science raft boards. The boards on the previous slides were corner raft boards, so I'm doing this both for the subsystem of uh, the four little corner rafts, but also the 23 uh, much bigger science raft packages. Um, Okay, that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, so it seems I have 20% uh, schedule left, which I can give back to the management. Do you have this one or that? Okay, great. I want to put the five minute timer right on that computer and then you can play. Oh, hello. hello, can you hear me? Uh, okay, I'm Justine Haupt. I'm, uh, I work at Brookhaven Lab uh, in New York. Um, I've been on the project since 2009. Um, let's see, Brookhaven Lab, New York, 2009. I'm, I'm an engineer. Um, uh, before 2009, uh, so pre-LSST, pre I was teaching violin and piano in people's homes. And I was working at the, the public observatory you see on the bottom right there. Um, and that's where I met my husband. Uh, this is kind of just a collage of interests. Because, you know, because it is. <laughs> uh, my husband's in the back of the room. He's David. There he is, in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, we do a lot of things together. Uh, we play traditional music. I, I'm also a fiddler. You see us there um, in uh, North Carolina. Uh, we love cats. There's a big 3D printer I'm working on in the basement. It's uh, bigger than a refrigerator in the middle. Uh, we're, we're consummate nerds. Uh, that's, uh, there's a picture there of us in front of, in front of the mothership from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, that's on display at the Udvar Hazy Center near Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm a pilot. I had an old plane. I sold it. Um, let's see. Uh, that's a corrected Gregorian telescope and working on just for fun. It's not done yet. Uh, there's a few projects I haven't finished. Uh, the thing on the bottom left 
is a 35 millimeter movie projector uh, that I was trying to save from oblivion, but that fell through because I don't text. Um, but those are cool, so. Anyway, I'm gonna show you some, uh, oh, what do I do, okay. Um, uh, mechanical and optical design for the sensors. We're developing the sensors at Brookhaven, uh, producing them, and uh, more recently I'm working on the commissioning camera. So uh, I'm just gonna show you a bunch of pictures of all the cool things I've been, been able to make. I think they're cool. Um, the one on the top left is uh, uh, the, the uh, one copy of many of the full uh, RTM, the 9TCD module testing cryostats. It's you know, kind of a small version of the camera. Um, uh, there's uh, made a, an in-vacuum RN55 X-ray exposure device, which uses a PCB as the stator for the, for, for the, the actuator, um, so that's kind of neat. There's a pinhole image of me uh, from one of the early uh, engineering grade ETV sensors. Um, let's see, uh, we did some telescope testing. Um, that cryostat on the left, uh, there's an early version on the bottom left that's going to become a, a version of that will become the commissioning camera cryostat. You can see on the top left, it's named Curzon. Uh, the other cryostats of that kind at Brookhaven are named Ezri, Jadzia, and Tarias. Does anybody know? <laughs> These are the Dax symbionts from Star Trek Deep Space Nine in reverse chronological order. Um, <laughs> uh, the other, uh, single sensor cryostats are named uh, after some of the other captains too. Um, here's uh, some of the more optical things I've uh, worked on. On the top left, it's an F1.2 point projector uh, based on a Schwarzschild objective. There's kind of a refractive element in there, some other changes. The, that photo in the middle of bottom is, um, it looks like a product photo, but that's, that's entirely uh, built in-house, um, what it wound up looking at and like. And you can see um, also on the top left what the re-imaged point looks like with the, with the uh, diffraction from the central obscuration, uh, LSST-like central obscuration uh, atmospheric turbulence simulator on the bottom left, um, uh, the single sensor test stand at Brookhaven optical tunnel, another optical tunnel for the 9CCD tests on the bottom right. You can see how dark it is. It's good, right? There's a light shining in there and it's still dark. Um, but uh, there might be some arguments about how dark it is. So anyway, <laughs> uh, now I'm mostly working on the commissioning camera cryostat. Um, this is uh, what it's basically going to look like. It's, uh, well, it shouldn't really look like that. That's the rendering from just last week, 37 seconds. Um, uh, the, and the, the one on the right is uh, another copy of that uh, camera test, test chamber at Slack. And that's not ComCam, but it'll look similar. Um, and uh, that's, that's it. Okay. Do you want to answer that? Just stand close enough to it or just in good faith? God, this is like a five minute timer. All right, so uh, like the uh, problem kid in class, I guess uh, at, the, at the back of the room, I, I get to uh, pull up the last of these talks. Uh, so my, I am Travis Lang. I'm a mechanical engineer at uh, Slack. I work on the camera integration and test. Um, I have <clears throat> been doing that job for three years. I was actually brought to Slack uh, just for that position. Um, before that, though, I worked at Lawrence Livermore National Lab on the National Ignition Facility. Um, I was responsible for the, you know, doing uh, many, many uh, optical mechanical mounts, uh, optical mechanical projects, but my main focus there was adding a short, a short pulse high energy laser system to the NIF, the National Ignition Facility. Um, so in the upper right corner picture, that is the final focusing and turning mirror for for that system. Um, you can see the, the, the reflective glass as well as uh, the, the, all the black glass there is basically stuff to, <clears throat> excuse me, to absorb um, backscattered laser light. And the lower right image is inside of the compressor vessel, which uh, actually took the, the laser pulses and shortened them from nanosecond durations to picosecond durations using a series of diffraction gratings. Uh, and both of these are in extremely large vacuum chambers that were held at about 10 to the minus five, or nearly 10 to the minus six torr. 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take a short little tangent now and tell you a, a little story of, about me. Um, when I was two years old, I had a, a big wheel. Does anybody remember what a big wheel is? Yeah, all right, good. All right. So I used to ride that thing all over the neighborhood and even beyond the neighborhood, you know, across town, on the country roads to the next town. Uh, and so my, my parents would enlist the helps of, of friends and neighbors, the family dog, um, and even the local boys in blue to help find me. Uh, <laughs> so I, I got the name of, nickname of Traveling Travis. And so that has kind of stuck with me. And so, uh, you know, a little over 10 years ago, I, I decided to take a little break from engineering. Uh, I became an adventure guide, so I, I took people on week-long uh, trips um, through a lot of different places. Uh, so I spent four years uh, up in Alaska. Uh, and I spent a lot of summers in southern Utah or Vermont or eastern Europe, and then some winters in some tropical locations. So I was a bit of a sun chaser, basically, following the weather to nice, warm, sunny places. Except for Alaska. It's never sunny and nice in Alaska. <clears throat> So on the, <clears throat> sorry, in the upper left, that's, that's me as a, a, a mahout, or a elephant driver in Thailand. And on the bottom picture there is in front of the Harding Ice Field in Alaska. So what is it that I do for LSST? Well, I'm, I'm currently trying to, you know, we're planning for how we assemble and test the camera. So this, this graphic has been shown many, at many different reviews and by many different people. I'm going to go through it really quickly just because I'm going to talk about a couple components of this in the next, set of sl next slide. So we have the 4K by 4K CCDs that Brookhaven is integrating into the, the Science Raft Tower module, or the RTM. And those, along with the Corner Raft version, which has the wavefront sensor and guiders, are installed into the Crystat. Um, and we also have the L3 lens assembly, which is both the final corrector and the vacuum barrier for the Crystat. <clears throat> we have five filters in a, in a carousel. Um, we have the exchange system, which does the handoff of, of switching those filters, uh, the camera body, the L1, L2, the first two corrector optics, the shutter, uh, the utility trunk, and <clears throat> the ele auxiliary electronics, which are the, all, the, all, the, all the electronics which are required for reading out uh, the images. So what is it that I fear the most on LSST? Well, frankly, it's uh, putting these Science Raft Tower modules into the cryostat. Uh, we have uh, roughly, you know, 500 microns of clearance around the CCDs of adjacent RTMs, and those uh, and those raft towers are roughly, you know, a half meter tall. So we have a 500 micron clearance at the CCDs, and we have about a millimeter of clearance during installation at the other end of the uh, of the of that RTM. So it's a very restricted system. Um, <clears throat> and without any sarcasm at all, I would just love to thank the folks who decided that having such a small gap um, was a wise idea. Um, so how are we solving that? So we have, we've decided that we're going to have a, a system of, of high accuracy stages, which will do the positioning and then the draw of the RTM into the cryostat. Um, we have two of the degrees of freedom of that system are going to be a set it and forget it, Based on metrology, and and I'm done one of this one second, and four four actively controlled uh, axes, so it's a real challenge. Um, I could bore you to bore you to uh, sleep with this system, um, but hopefully next year I can show you some images of a whole bunch of raft towers installed into the cryostat. That's it. Okay, great. So I would like to thank 12 speakers who all gave impeccably uh, delivered and timed talks, and I would like to thank everyone in this room for what you're doing for LSST. So uh, my only announcement is that Chris Montgomery confirmed that trivia will begin at 7.30, and if folks want to congregate around 7, there'll be a cash bar, a chance to uh, make your trivia teams and start uh, interacting before the games begin. And I think that we're good on announcements. Nothing else before the break? Great. So thank you all very much.